Welcome back to On the Move with Victor Xi. This is Victor Xi. It is Thursday, June 15th. The front runner of the Republican nomination for president has been impeached twice, indicted twice, and found liable for sexual assault. Yet to this day, it doesn't seem like his support among his fans and the Republican Party has weakened much. He still leads the polls by far. And while there are some principled conservatives who are taking a stand against Trump, it's far from comforting giving the overwhelming number of Republicans in office who are still rushing to Trump's defense no matter what he does. So as I'm sure many are wondering, what should we make of this Republican Party? Will anything change? And I am lucky to be joined by someone who is one of those Republicans willing to speak out uh, against Donald Trump. And she is, of course, S.E. Cup, who is a political analyst for CNN, writer for New York Daily News, and so much more. Uh, S.E., it is so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Always fun. Thanks for having me, Victor. Of course. So I have to start off by asking you about kind of the three, at least to me, the three different buckets that I'm seeing within the Republican Party. You have people like Mitt Romney, Liz Cheney, Chris Christie, who are willing to call out Trump for what he's done. You have people like Josh Hawley, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who defend Trump no matter what he does or says. And then you have the people like kind of Mitch McConnell, Mike Pence, I don't know, Nikki Haley, who haven't really said anything or seem unsure about where they exactly stand with Trump. I'm wondering if that's how you see it. And if so, kind of what you make of the kind of split within the Republican Party right now? It's not much of a split. I think you're mm-hmm. you're right about those buckets. But, you know, you named, I think, Mitt Romney, Chris Christie, and Liz Cheney. I'd throw Adam Kinzinger in there. Yes, That's yes. four people in all of Congress that you and I could probably name who have, in any consistent way, disavowed Trump. Um, that's, that's not a lot, right? They're so not, there's not... Yeah. And then everyone else is either defending him completely or for from like from time to time. So that's not much of a split to me. To me, that says most of the party yeah, is yeah. defending Trump or silent, um, which to me is the same thing. Um, that's where the party is. And it seems to me that that's where most of the 2024 contenders are, too, which I don't have to tell you is weird if they're trying to beat him. Um, it's weird (laughs) that they're not taking this opportunity to draw the contrast. Like I am not under indictment. I did not incite an insurrection. Uh, you'd want, you'd think to draw those contrasts so that you could win, but they're so afraid, you know, of the 2016 ghost that is still haunting the Republican party and how effectively Trump just dismantled everyone they're just afraid to go after him completely. Yeah. I have so much to ask you about 2024, but I really quickly want to ask you about the whole kind of indictment and documents case, because we remember back in back before, you know, the 2016 election, Republicans spent so long and so many hearings going over the, you know, the Hillary Clinton uh, email case. But those same Republicans who did that are defending Trump and saying, you know, but her emails, you know, this is a witch hunt. I'm wondering if you can find any defense to their claims. And if not, why do they keep doing this? What is kind of motivating the Republican Party right now? Well, I'll, I'll echo what Chris Christie said in our CNN town hall debate yeah, that, yeah. look, those things were bad. What what Hillary Clinton did, um, I, I don't even have to quote a Republican. My friend Van Jones, a liberal, said if he had done that, he'd be in Guantanamo. That's his line. Um, that was bad. We cared about that. We were right to. And it's not hard to see a double standard. It seems like there might be a double standard. But that's not an excuse to um, toss accountability out the window. That was bad. Let's not be worse. Um, So, no. And the fact that, you know, the people who are outraged by any of these indictments were the same people who were outraged by the impeachments. All the stuff that they were not outraged by really tells you everything you need to know. Not outraged by the content of these indictments not outraged by credible accusations of rape and sexual abuse, not outraged by inciting violence at the Capitol, not outraged by any of the myriad things he did while in office. All of that was fine. But this pursuing accountability, that's the offense. I'm sorry. You've got, you've, you don't really have a lot of credibility if that's how inconsistent you've, yeah. you've been on these issues. I mean, you, I, I feel like the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, the Lauren Boberts of the world might actually believe in what they say. But for most of the Republicans 
who are saying, well, you know, this is President Biden coming after Donald Trump or some political witch hunt. Or, I mean, they are basically kind of all of the crazy Republican claims right now. I feel like they know better. I, I, don't you or do you think that kind of they, they believe in what they're saying right now? Yeah. So the other buckets um, that we can view the Republican constellation through. There's buckets of people who are true believers, yeah. who I think truly believe in some of the conspiracy theories, um, believe in stuff like white replacement theory. And um, they really do believe, and I'm not sure you're ever going to sort of um, jog those guys loose. Mm -hmm. Then there's a bucket of people who know better and are saying what they say either as a grift or to cling to power um, or to appease Trump and stay on his yeah, good side. Yeah. And then I think there's a bucket of people who know this stuff is garbage. Mm -hmm. They even probably know that it's dangerous and bad, but they also know that to get through a Republican primary or you know, to implement conservative policy, things that you, you care about, sometimes you're gonna have to court this stuff. That's a calculation. Yeah. Now, I obviously disagree with that calculation, but I've met a number of Republicans who would say, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, it's wrong. Yeah, it's terrible. But Democrats are worse. We need to, you know, implement conservative policies. And this is how you get there. That's really interesting. I mean, for the buckets two and three, though, I mean, after all this time, after six years of countless scandals and, and clear instances where Donald Trump poses a danger to our rule of law and democracy, will there be an off ramp? And if so, what will that off ramp be? An offer him for Republicans? Yeah, for, I guess, the kind of the buckets two and three who are kind of believe in this and still support Trump after all this time. It, will there be an offer him to get them kind of off of the Trump train and maybe onto another train, at least in 2024? I mean, there are plenty of offer to get off the Trump train, to, to choose yeah. a new nominee, to decide you want to win again and he's not the vehicle to do that. There are plenty of mm -hmm. off we, We're seeing them right now. These indictments would be an off -ramp. And I think for some Republicans, they might. But to really get past Trump, you have to be willing to abandon some of his voters, like a good mm -hmm. chunk of his voters, not all Republicans, not even all Trump supporters, but you need to be able to abandon like the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, QAnon, white supremacists, this, this wing of the party that Republicans contorted to court at the expense of good conservatives. Yeah. Like those were the people they wanted to let in and people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, well, they needed to be kicked out. That's how crazy and lopsided the, the parties become. If they're not willing to say no to his voters, which might mean losing some elections, yeah. then Trumpism stays alive and well. And they're still clinging to all the bad stuff that Trump did just yeah. without the guy attached to it. And to me, that's the same. That's just as bad. So I, if that's a good segue into 2024, I mean, you have people who I think are willing to do that. Chris Christie, Asa Hutchinson, who really disagree with Trump on uh, very, very uh, vocally, but are focused on traditional principles of conservatism. Do they have any path, though, to the 2024 nomination to clinching that? Or um, is this sort of just kind of their alarm bell ring and hopefully they can reach some people? I think it's mostly B, but I wouldn't put, you know, I wouldn't count anyone out. Yeah. Um, Asa Hutchinson is a long shot only because of his name ID issues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just not a well-known person the way Chris Christie is, for example. Um, and his appeal to like good conservatism, um, policies and ideas. These are all things I like, yeah. right. But I'm in the minority in my party. Now, those are not the things that are currently animating Republican voters, but uh, listen, I think. Chris Christie, it was presumed, came in with like a kamikaze mission, willing yeah. to lose and, you know, hoping to just kind of stop Trump or, or injure him um, politically. I don't know. He could win, uh, you know, over the course of a very long campaign. Right. It's 18 months away or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of things can happen. So I wouldn't count anyone out just yet. And if Chris Christie wins, do you think he fares better than Trump in the general election? I do. I think pretty much anyone would fare better than Trump in the general <laughs> yeah. election. Biden's yeah. not a very strong candidate. Um, I think, you know, Democrats know that. And so, yeah, I think Trump um, most definitely will fail against Biden again. Mm -hmm. 
But no, I think another kind of Republican would definitely have have a shot. And it doesn't even have to be someone I like. I mean, I think Ron DeSantis might have a shot against Mm. uh, against Joe Biden. It really just depends on how all of this shakes out over the next few months. So we've talked a lot about the Republican elected officials running, but I quickly want to ask you about the Republican kind of supporters or people within the Republican Party, because you come from that world. What do people think, at least the people who you've been talking to and some of what you've been hearing about everything going on with Trump? Do you think more people are sort of peeling off and um, supporting people like Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson, or is it still pretty much solidly around Trump? I mean, most Republican voters are solidly behind Trump. And, you know, CNN's gone to Trump rallies and events and Mm -hmm. very recently interviewed Trump supporters who said they don't care about the indictments, they don't believe them. Um, I think that's a pretty common belief among Republican voters. Now, I think there's fewer Republican voters than there were in 2020 and 2016. Mm. And so they might be fully pure and loyal and rabid, but I think there are more increasingly more moderates, more independents um, and more folks who are kind of just in the center right and not completely aligned with Trump. Uh, You know, are they going to go and vote for Joe Biden? I don't know, but they might go ahead and vote for someone like Chris Christie, um, you know, or Tim Scott or Nikki Haley. So we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I, I hope that, you know, the party can move beyond Trump and, and get onto, even though I disagree with Chris Christie politically, um, it seems like he's actually willing to, you know, stand up to the dangers that are within this Republican party right now. And I respect him for that. And I, I'm wondering just as a last question, kind of someone who's been inside this Republican party for so long, what is your message to people listening about kind of where your party is and how, and kind of what this country could go through if we reelect Trump another time in 2024? It's really even hard to imagine that prospect, Um, but we should. Listen, I was just talking to a Republican, I'll say a Republican member of Congress. I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, we need to burn it down. The party does not deserve to win, even with someone good and conservative, like a Tim Scott or a a Chris, we don't deserve to win because we have not fully cleansed, ridden the party of those awful elements that that Trump courted and Republicans allowed him to court. Um, You know, the white supremacists, the anti-Semites, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the conspiracy nuts, the QAnon, all that melange of, of sort of garbage. Trump said, come one, come all, and Republicans let him. Um, until we say to those voters, which shouldn't be hard, uh, we don't want you white supremacists. Yeah. Um, we don't want your vote, Oath Keepers. Uh, QAnon, we don't believe you. We don't We don't think you're patriots. Um, we think you're pretty dangerous. Until we do that, there's no moving past Trump. And Republicans don't deserve to win, even if they do it kind of mm-hmm. cutely. Um, I, I And I tend to agree with that. Uh, summation of where the party's at. I don't think we deserve to win until we have returned to our conservative values, policies and principles, ideas that Trump jettisoned because he didn't care about them and stop allowing these awful elements into the party and and letting them to wear the party banner. Um, That's not good for the country and it's not good for the party. I mean, I hope we can return to that world in which we can have two functioning political parties. And um, I mean, that's a long time, though. Yeah. And that's a sobering assessment that we have to burn kind of what we all kind of see right now down to the ground and just kind of restart um, with this Republican Party. But maybe one day, I hope. Maybe one day. Uh, Yeah. Essie Cup, thank you so much for joining me this morning. And thank you so much for all that you do for keeping us informed and uh, really providing just such a clear eyed assessment of where we are with this Republican Party. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Victor. Thanks so much. Oh, 
Essie Cup is always wonderful. Um, you know, this is her second time coming on the show. So thank you, Essie, for joining. Um, just a couple of things before um, we wrap up the day. Uh, there was some interesting news uh, this morning about a Supreme Court case uh, regarding kind of native lands and, and, and uh, Indian welfare child policy. And uh, there's some good news out of uh, the Supreme Court this morning, uh, which is com- maybe comes as a surprise to a lot of people. Um, but basically, the Supreme Court ruled with the Native Americans um, uh, side. And it's a good, I think, victory for anyone who cares about kind of Native uh, Americans, you know, um, land, tr- uh, tribal families. So these basically Native adoptions can now give priority to tribal families. And um, the Supreme Court upheld that fe- federal law intended to rectify past government abuses, uh, seven to two with Amy Coney Barrett writing for the majority. So um, that is a very good sign. And I don't know if this is any comfort for anyone who already has lost trust in the Supreme Court, but we'll see what the other Supreme Court decisions are going to be. But at least this this case uh, is a surprise to many people. And so right now the Supreme Court has upheld that Native American adoption law. And uh, it is, I think, good news for anyone who, I guess, is doubting the, the Supreme Court, doubting the rule of law. At least, you know, we see some glimmer of hope that maybe some of those justices still have um, some clarity. But, you know, there are some big cases coming down the pipe this term, including this affirmative action case, which I know uh, concerns a lot of people. Um, so we'll keep an eye on all of that uh, for you. Uh, yesterday, there was also a really interesting um, development in the House, uh, probably not worth anyone's time to think about, you know, in the long run, but it's just kind of an interesting assessment of where we are as a country right now in Congress. You basically had Republicans um, led by this uh, Republican Texas, Anna Paul, Paula Lena, I think is her, her last name, but she's this kind of Republican in Texas, and she brought a censure vote against Representative Adam Schiff for basically investigating Donald Trump in 2016, um, questioning his ethics. Um, She threatened to find him $16 million for his uh, role in that investigation. And yesterday, the vote pretty much failed spectacularly. You had 220 uh, House members vote against that resolution with 20 Republicans voting with the Democrats. And that vote uh, and that censure and that resolution failed. Uh, But it just kind of speaks to, you know, what are the priorities within the Republican Party right now? Because right now you're seeing them not really do much on economic policy, not really do much on any of the other policies that make um, America kind of you know unique. They're they're really skirting all of those things and prioritizing things like uh, Adam Schiff uh, and trying to censure him. And I think it's just a shame for any who cares about good governance. You know they're not caring about any of the issues that impact our lives. And I think a lot of this, what we're seeing right now is a distraction from the real issues that are impacting Americans. It's a distraction from uh, the latest Trump indictment. It's a distraction from the kind of challenges and legal challenges that the front runner of the Republican nomination still faces. Um, And I don't think any of us should be distracted by that or fooled by kind of what they're trying to do. It's dangerous. And I think it's uh, kind of a really sad indication of where the Republican Party is right now. But like I always say, the good news is that we have the power to reelect uh, a hopefully better kind of representative body in 2024 uh, by electing people who are principled, who actually believe in the rule of law, who believe in democracy. And that comes in 2024 by using our voices, going out to the ballot box and doing our research, frankly, and really making sure that we're voting for people who reflect the principles and the kind of you know moment that we're in right now um, and who won't focus on things like censuring people just for investigating uh, legitimately people like Donald Trump. And so uh, that was, I thought, an interesting development in the House, but it has failed, which is good news. And Adam Schiff remains and they won't be able to silence him. But uh, never forget that this is what the Republican Party is choosing to focus on. Um, And I guess with that, I think that provides a good segue for tomorrow's episode with Simone Sanders Townsend, who is an MSNBC anchor, uh, former you know top political operative within the Biden administration, Biden campaign, Bernie Sanders campaign as well. Um, so we'll talk about the weekly news and kind of uh, how we move forward and how we cover this, how the media should be covering this. It'll be a really interesting episode with Simone Sanders Townsend uh, tomorrow at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon or on my Twitter page at VictorShe2020. You can find us live every morning at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern, right here on youtube.com slash Politicon or my Twitter. Thank you all for watching this episode of On The Move, and I will see you all tomorrow.